Well, let me share another miracle with you. If I can find this morning. Uh, Crean and Bill Kramer were married last night, and they're here this morning. That's a miracle. There he is, right there. Someone said to me the other day, why do, uh, why do men marry smart women? And I just couldn't think of it. They said, because opposites attract. <laughs> that doesn't apply to them. <laughs> it was a pleasure to do that and, and to see them here serving the Lord every week. And it's just neat. On the screen, you see missions, the church's purpose. Missions, the church's purpose. What is the purpose of the church? It's right there. A couple weeks ago, I met with a lady that had attended church here, and uh, she was talking about missions, just on a casual conversation. And she said, Pastor, she said, I don't believe that we should be sending people all over the world and, and spending all that money overseas when we can use it here. I didn't want to get into a long theological discussion with her because we didn't have time. But when I left that meeting with her, I just said, well, you're, you're welcome to have your opinion, and I, I don't agree with that, but we just didn't have time to talk. But later I began to think about if we had time, we could sit down, how would we answer somebody like that? And then I went to the scriptures, Matthew 28, 19 being the first one I read, and you're going to help me when I am silent, I want you to say the word, okay? Perfect. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's some key words there. Go, <coughs> making disciples and all nations. And then I read in Acts 1.8 when... Uh, the church was going to be established by Jesus Christ. He had already died on the cross, rose again, ascended back up to the Father, and he was going to send us the Holy Spirit. And uh, he gave us a reason for it. He says, but you will receive power. Pretty weak. When the, we can't do that. It's power. power. You, shall, <laughs> you shall receive power. power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now take a look at that. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Now we like that. Because we like things we can see and tangible. And we like to uh, uh, shout and jump. And we like to see uh, spectacular things. And we like to see it on the screen. And we like, you know, bells and whistles and guns going off. And then, man, we think that. But he said you'll be receiving power. That's the same word dunamis, which same thing as we get our word dynamite, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now we thought, oh boy, the flash, the bang, the power, the, you know, it's, but if we've stopped there, we wouldn't have any reason for it, would we? Why will we receive that power? He said that you will be my witnesses. witnesses. That's it. That's the purpose of the church. To share the message of Jesus Christ that he died for lost sinners. Now, how many are lost sinners? Everybody. Yeah, if you hadn't noticed, that's all of us. The good news is that Jesus died for lost sinners. Amen. And he rose again, not only to forgive our sins, but to deliver us from the power of sin and the shame of sin and uh, the guilt of sin. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Amen. Now, he said, I want you to take that message to all the world. First starting in your home area, spreading out unto the ends of the earth. Now I thought about that. He's speaking to 11 men that were Jews. Some 2,000 years ago, he's thinking about us here. He's thinking about a little lady that was born in a farm in this area, in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Now how many of you think, just think, that possibly those 11 disciples 2,000 years ago didn't know there was a UP. I didn't know it 29 years ago. They didn't know about the rest of the world. You know why? Most of them hadn't traveled 50 to 100 miles from where they were born. 
They didn't have the transportation. We have, didn't have communication. We have, and so they were Jews. These eleven men uh, living at that time, no idea of North America, no idea of the United States, no idea of the UP, no idea of Michigan. These were eleven men who probably just were homebodies. Eleven men who were very isolated. Jewish men who thought that everybody else, even people around them that were not Jews, were foreigners and strangers and heathens. Now, that's quite a commission now to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They had no concept of the vastness and the bigness of that commission. But they were obedient and they became the nucleus of a movement that reaches around the world that we have today and that we're a part of as New Life Assembly of God Church. And their uh, grasp of that commission enabled that little farm girl that doesn't believe we should send missionaries, that commission enabled them to pass that mandate on to their children and to the church and to their descendants and to the church after them and the generation after them and the generation after them. How many would I have to say to go 2,000 years until one day that very start nucleus that they had reached the UP and in 2013 has saved that little farm girl? Now, if we followed her theology through the scripture, she wouldn't be saved today. She would never have heard about Jesus Christ because we're not Jewish. We don't live in Israel. And uh, aren't you glad that they took that serious? Aren't you glad they didn't say, well, I think we'll only reach our own and we'll just, uh, we'll just do our thing, but I don't think we better reach out. We don't want to get too far away. We don't want to send any money to any other places. We just want to think about ourselves. And so that message of Jesus Christ, even though it was a gigantic task, became a very urgent mission of repentance and forgiveness to all the world. They caught the passion of it. And how do I explain that to us today? Because sometimes we lose the, the, you know, the real passion of what we're supposed to be doing, don't we? And we know about it, it's up here, but we lose the heart of it. It, it gets kind of dim. I, I shared this morning earlier about a, a, a little four-year-old girl, and uh, her parents had a baby brother brought it home, and uh, she just loved that little baby brother, and she always was asking mom and daddy, I want to be with my brother alone, and you know, things that go through your mind, <laughs> you know, you don't care for the kid, huh? Um, so anyway, they would never let her alone with the baby brother. She kept asking him, mom, daddy, I want to be with baby brother by myself. So finally, she wore him down, and and they were probably just curious what, what she would do with baby brother. And so they said she could go in and be alone with baby brother. So in she went into the bedroom by the crib and, or the bassinet or whatever they had there. And she thought the door was closed. But of course, mom and daddy are smarter than the average bear. And they left it open so they could see. And the little four-year-old went up to the baby brother that was oblivious. And... Uh, kind of in the shadows of the room, and she got down by his little crib there, bassinet, and knelt, and she looked him right in the eye, she was about this close, and she said, uh, baby brother, she said, would you tell me what Jesus looks like? I'm starting to forget. <laughs> now, I want you to get the message other than the oh's. <laughs> is that sometimes we can forget the heart of what we know, amen? Let me get it probably in an illustration. Karen Watson was a missionary to Iraq, 2004. She was 38 years old, and she was killed as her car was ambushed in Mosul. And she had written what they call the last letter, and in some missionary movements, they write what is called the last letter. And really what it is is a letter that's to be given to the pastor to read to the congregation should something happen to that person. Otherwise, it's never to be open. And when she was, car was ambushed and she was killed, the pastor got the letter and he began to read it. And I want to read it to you so I don't mess it up here. It said, Dear Pastor, you should only be opening this letter in the event of my death. 
When God calls, there are no regrets. To obey God was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory, my reward. The missionary heart cares more than some think is wise, risks more than some thinks is safe, dreams more than some thinks is practical, expects more than some thinks is possible. I was called not to comfort or success, but to obedience. That's the spirit of the missionary message that Jesus gave to the disciples, who in turn took that message and over the generations brought it to us. And you know what? I hope that never dies. I hope that flame, that passion to carry the message that was passed on through generations and to us, that we don't drop it as New Life Assembly of God Church. Amen? Amen. That we keep that fire alive, that spirit passed on to us by the early church. A spirit and the message. The message hasn't changed, but sometimes the passion has, and we just uh, share it academically when we should be realizing that people are lost and dying and bound for hell, and they, and they ha need not because they have a Savior, Jesus Christ, and they have hope, and they have forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so these 11 people were called. Now I want you to think about this. And I'll think about yourself, because we like to go where it's comfortable, don't we? If I want to find a church, I want people, want people just like me. I want, you know, where they kind of dress like me, and they kind of look like me, and they kind of act like me, and they kind of think like me, and I'm just comfortable, and I just fit in, and people say, oh, this is my, I'm just comfortable here. Now think about those 11 disciples. God was calling them to go to a people that looked different. He was calling them to go to a church that talked different and expressed themselves different and even had different languages. He was calling them to a world and to a mission field that dressed totally different from them, that did things different from them, that had a culture of doing things different from them, and that they might be very uncomfortable going to them but they needed to carry the message, and they went. Now, Dr. Ed Statzer, who's a church planter, and he, and he trains church planters all over the world, and so then he gets invited all over the world in different parts of the country as well, and he got invited to Oklahoma City. And uh, when his plane landed, and he was to go to this blue-collar Oklahoma church, it was a little late, so when he got to the church, the worship service was already in progress and they were singing and probably you know the song and but here's how it went I heard an old old story yeehaw <laughs> yeehaw hooray about a savior came from glory yahoo this is how they were singing and gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. Yeehaw! Hallelujah! And on and on they went. And this visiting pastor, he said, wow. First of all, they're singing country and western. He didn't think God could use country and western. He's from New York. <laughs> <laughs> then he looks out over the pews and he says, strangest thing. They had these theater seats, which is fine. But he looked and, and there was a person and an empty seat. A person, empty seat. You'd be in tough shape, Alan. Yep. No space between you. <laughs> another person in an empty seat. Another person in an empty seat. I could keep going on. All through the congregation, he thought, wow, that's pretty strange. I wonder what. And then he looked a little closer, and here's what it was. A person, a Stetson cowboy hat. A person, a Stetson cowboy hat. A person, a Stetson cowboy hat. And, and that's the way it was through the whole congregation. And then he preached the sermon. And as he preached, he would say a few words and, Yeehaw! Preach it, Pastor! Wahoo! And uh, he'd go a little further and, Yeehaw! Preach it, Pastor! And finally he said, I'm trying to if you quit interrupting me. <laughs> and it just kept going like that. And uh, finally he was done and, and uh, he sat down and they began to sing again and then, you know, the same thing. He'd sing a, a line and yeah, there was shouts and hollers. All, 
And uh, so he went out for lunch with him afterwards. And, uh, you know, in the, I guess there's a typical greasy spoon there that you got to go to if you're in that part of the country. And uh, he, he sat across from a guy named Bob. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Bob had, uh, he asked Bob the story, uh, uh, how did you come to be part of this church, Bob? See, this is a new church plant. And Bob started telling the story. He says, well, he said, I, I, I got out of prison six months ago. And I want to look for a church. And he said, I went to the first one, but I, I couldn't afford the kind of clothes that they wore. And I couldn't afford to go to the places for fellowship that they went to, so I looked for another one. He said, I went to another church, but when they found out I'd been in prison, they didn't accept me and I couldn't fit in. And he said, so I came here, and he said, I've been radically saved and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Yahoo! <laughs> and this preacher from New York, he's thinking, he says, you know, we may not look alike, dress alike, talk alike, but God is there. And somebody came and planted a church there where I certainly don't feel comfortable. Then he was invited to another church in a big city. In that church was another church plant. They only met on Sunday nights. It was full of musicians and aspiring musicians. And you know how musicians can be. I mean, they're a little different. <laughs> and uh, he looked out over them and they were professional groups. And, you know, some had mohawk haircuts, some had spikes. Some had tattoos all over them and some had earrings in their ears and other places. He said it looked like they just came up, had fallen into a tackle box and came to the service. <laughs> and uh, he said the service started and they, and they, you know, some would share songs that they had written. And some would share something else that they had written. And, you know, it's like it, 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 they were kind of the creative type, you know. And uh, he said, so when the song service was done, he said, I preached. And he said, I was very uncomfortable in this group. And he said, so when they were done, I went in the back and sat again. And he said, somebody got up there, one of the gentlemen got up, and it was communion time. And he said to the congregation, he said, now, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this isn't for you. He said, if you're here this morning, uh, this evening, and you've got sin in your life that you're, you're not willing to deal with, he said, this isn't for you. He said, but the rest of you, I want you to come up and take communion. And so about half of them came up. They took communion, and then the next part was very interesting because they took their bread and their emblem, and they went back to those that didn't come up, and they knelt by them, and they prayed. And he said it wasn't long between before the whole service was disrupted by people weeping and confessing their sins and turning to the Lord. And I said, I didn't feel comfortable in that church. He said, but somebody did. Or somebody that wasn't very comfortable heard the call of God on their life and went there anyway and started a church. And God was there. And God was there. Now you can imagine how these isolated Jewish men felt when God gave them that mandate when Jesus told them, I want you to now, I want you to go out to your community. And then I want you to go into Judea, which are Jewish people. And then I want you to go to Samaria, which are mixed people. And then I want you to go to the ends of the earth. To strange people you don't even know and you can't speak the language. You don't know the customs and, they're, they, and you're not comfortable. I want you to do it. Because I want to get the message out. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think we're getting the message that God is interested in missions. Amen? Amen. It was 1950. Two men finally scaled the heights of the mountain, 26,000 feet, first ones to do it. They'd had such difficulty and it was such a strenuous climb, fraught with danger all the way up. And and, and they persevered in all of the danger that they seen. They overcame the obstacles. They conquered the mountain. And they got to the top. Now, I was sharing a little earlier this morning my feelings when I conquered Mount Rainier with my car. 
I drove to the top. But when I got out and I stood on those uh, magnificent cliffs looking out over those deep valleys and that mountain and the snow and the magnificence of it being up that high, uh, it, was, it was a great feeling even though I drove up. Imagine what it would be like to climb up there, conquer it all, and stand at the top of the peak and see over what's below. Magnificent. It was so overwhelming of a feeling to them that when they came down and they were interviewed, they, they just couldn't express. You know how reporters are. So what did you feel when you fell down 300 feet and broke every bone in your body? <laughs> or, uh, you know, they asked a dumb question. So what does it feel like not to be able to breathe? <laughs> they asked them how it felt, what they had to say. They, they, they were speechless. They couldn't explain the magnificence and the feeling they had of conquering all of that. And uh, finally, when one was able to talk, he thought about it a little bit. And here's what he said talking about other climbers. Because climbers are quite a fraternity, aren't they? And here's words I want you to think about and let them sink into your spirit. He said, if only the others could know. If only the others could know. Doesn't that sum up what missions are all about? We sit here, we hear the message, we have great music, we bring in concerts, people sing about Jesus, we have classes, we have availability, stuff we have, radio, we, have, we can hear it a hundred times a day if we want to. And we enjoy it, and I thank God for it. And, uh, but think of all the people who never hear it. Think of all the people who never experienced salvation, never experienced forgiveness of sin, don't know who Jesus is, don't know what he did on the cross, don't know that he's the son of God, don't know that they can have a relationship with the heavenly father, don't realize they can know God and they're searching and wondering and, and, and stumbling through the dark. They don't have hope, and they don't have peace, they don't have that joy. They just don't understand the great message of the cross and the empty tomb. And so they said, if only the others could know. And that, my friend, is the essence of the disciples' message. The ultimate conquest has been won. The highest peak spiritually, the greatest obstacles, the toughest battles have been conquered. Life has conquered death. Righteousness has conquered sin. God's love has triumphed over Satan's hatred. Death and hell have been overcome by the cross and the empty tomb. There's great joy for each one of us if only the others could know. I want our church to be a missionary church. It is a missionary church. I want us to have the heart. It's not who can raise the most money and who can have the most posters on the board. That's a part of it, but that's not it. The, the part of it is, is why we're doing it. We want to be a part of what God has told us to do. We want to be a big part, as big a part as we can. We want each one of us to have a share in it. We want to stand before God someday because we know what he told us to do, going all over the world and preach the gospel. We may not be able to go all over the world, but we can send people. We can be a voice that goes out right in our community, right in our city, in our state, in our nation, and across the world. Amen? Amen. Little New Life Assembly of God can do that. I think I can, I think I can, right? Only if we all pull together. When I was over in Haiti, oh, what a sad country. What a sad country. No resources, people are poor, no hope. If you did go to school, which most of them don't graduate, if you did, where would you work? There's no jobs, there's no infrastructure. It's, it's poverty everywhere you look. And then, of course, they had the great uh, earthquake there that destroyed what little bit they had. Um, they've been steeped in voodoo worship for years and years. You know, instead of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us, they've got the blood of chickens and goats and worshiping Satan and spirits and demons. Much of their country, country is hungry, goes to bed maybe with one meal a day. I thank God for Conway Hope. 
that goes over there and feeds thousands and thousands of kids every day or they wouldn't eat. And guess what? We're part of that. Did you hear what Lorraine said? We've taken them on. We've sent. We've gone. Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand. And we're going to do more. And a lot of you maybe won't be able to go there, but you're going to send someone. And you see the hopelessness and the yearning in the eyes of those little kids. And you look at you, your heart goes out. You say, I'm going to do something. Maybe I'm not going to go, but I know there's people willing to go and can go, and I'm going to support them. And same way with Africa and all those names that are on that, uh, on those frame, in those frames back there. But when I was there, I talked to the people and I see God is moving in that country. There's a revival going on, not just spiritually, but because of that, a compassion for the, for the people and the kids and their needs. Multiply that type Russia where we said Israel, Africa, South America. Maybe they haven't seen us, but every month they get something that says we care. What do I say to that gal when I see her again? I'm going to say to her, you know, you wouldn't know Jesus Christ today if somebody thought like you thought. And I want to help you to understand what the scriptures say so you can be a part of it. I want to close with this. In November, we take pledges. And you've been so good this year, one of our greatest missionary up giving for a year. But many of you didn't get in on it. Maybe you weren't here, or maybe you didn't hear about it, and uh, you didn't make a pledge for this year. We still have about six months left of our pledge year. And we have cards in the back you can get from the ushers. Uh, it just, it's just a pledge card that says, I will give so much a month or one-time giving to missions, and you will be supporting some of those programs or all of them that you've seen on the screen. We want you to be able to have a part. Not that we, we have to have your money or anything, but we want you to have, be, have the privilege of having a part and saying, I can do something. Kids, teenagers, don't wait till you someday when you've got a big job and you're making lots of money, then I'll give. Start now, even if it's a few dollars, even if it's BGMC. It's something. Let's do something for missions. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today, you're in this service, this is where missionary work starts. We want you to know that Jesus died for you. We want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you and he cares about you and he can wash away your sins and he can help you start a new life. He wants to be a part of you. He wants to be the main part of your life. He wants to bring you that peace you're looking for and that joy of sins forgiven, of being ready to meet God, of fellowship with him. He wants you to be a part of his great work that he's doing all around the world because one day he's coming back for his people. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, we want to introduce you to Jesus. I would like the deacons I have in the service. Please come. Please come. Quickly. These people will pray with you if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Or if you're going through a deep trial or a deep struggle and you want some, you need prayer, these people will pray with you. Uh, you want joining your husband if you would? That would be Pat. <laughs> okay, are these all the, yeah, are these all the deacons I have in the service? Phyllis and Dean, maybe you'll help me out. We just want to introduce you to Jesus or we just want to pray with you. We believe in prayer, amen? Amen. We believe in prayer. That's why you have been asked to pray for the meetings come. Hey, I'm looking for some real breakthroughs spiritually and in people's lives with these meetings called an evangelist that God uses especially in those areas of uh, uh, healing and, and deliverance and things like that and breaking of strongholds and introducing people to the joy of the Lord so we need a time to emphasize please pray there are some prayer sheets on the information table out there you can grab some of those be praying for that Father we're going to ask you to dismiss us now and we thank you that we have a part in this great endeavor of missions that you've asked us to do, you've mandated us to do, you've saved us to do. 
That's the purpose of the church. We want to do it, Lord, as a church. We want to join our hands, Lord, and not a few people do it all, but all of us having a part, even if it's small. And we pray, Lord, that you will impress that on our hearts and that, that we might have a passion and a compassion for the lost and to do your work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to be dismissed, but if you need some prayer, will you please come? You can be in connections for the next 15 minutes. Parents, please remember by noon, pick up your kids from the kids' zone or preschool. God bless you. If you want.